Uh, yeah, good morning everyone. So let's get started. Um, okay, so my talk is uh, uh, called uh, Making Architecture Ex Ex Explicit. It talks about uh, many things, um, but first, oh, first I need to turn this on. First a bit about me. I'm uh, Portuguese. I uh, graduated in IT and then I became a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher for a few years. Got in, then I uh, get, uh, got fed up with it and uh, decided to be a software developer. Um, currently, I'm a lead developer at Werkspot in uh, the Netherlands. And I yeah, like good food, good wine, coding, just like uh, pretty much everyone else here. And I love my uh, Blackie, my motorbike. So what this uh, talk is about, it's about ideas from uh, people that are way smarter than me. They've been in the business for many, many years, 30, 40, maybe more. <coughs> they have the ideas from 20, 30, maybe 40 years ago. Ideas that are still valid today, ideas that uh, we still don't know them very well today. Uh, we don't use them enough. And in the end, it's uh, also about how you put all those ideas together in order to create uh, good quality software that is uh, reliable and it is maintainable for uh, many years. <coughs> However, no matter uh, how much um, I'm confident about what I'm saying here today, there are no silver bullets, there's no holy grail, there's no one boot fits all. In the end, we need to understand all ideas, um, increase our, uh, our toolkit of ideas and patterns and knowledge, and then analyze the project that we have at hand and we'll analyze the, pro the, the problems that we need to solve, and then use the tools that are uh, uh, fitting the solution. <coughs> History is uh, very interesting for me. I think it's uh, very important. Um, <coughs> we all have our own uh, personal history. We do mistakes along the way, and then we try to learn from them, and uh, hopefully not repeat them very often. As a country as well, we have mistakes um, along the way. That's why we learn history at school, right? That we, so that we try not to make the same mistakes. Um, Portugal had a dictatorship, for example. Uh, so we learned that at school, so that we try not to uh, get convinced into getting a dictatorship again. So we learn from uh, history, and um, we as a community should also learn from history. So let's uh, take a look at, uh, at the last few years in software development. So we started off with um, non-structured programming. Back then it was maybe the 50s. It was just a series of uh, uh, assembly commands uh, scattered or, or splashed on the screen. Moved on from there to structured programming because we were repeating a lot of code. So we came up with um, conditionals and with uh, uh, loops to help us not repeat so much code. And then we moved on to procedural and functional programming, where you can actually group uh, sections of code, then call them whenever we need them. And finally, we came to object-oriented programming, which groups uh, uh, data with uh, the related functionality that, uh, that should change and, uh, and manipulate that data. And this was, uh, OOP was in the, showed up in the beginning of the 80s, maybe a bit before, but then in the beginning of the 80s was when actually started to pick up. And after that, the, the language paradigms, they didn't really evolve much. So we, but the problems kept, kept evolving and kept growing, software kept growing, and we needed something more, so we uh, turned our heads into uh, design patterns. On the other hand, at a more um, coarse granular uh, view, we started with the monolith, of course. Everything one sing single program. <coughs> then, in the beginning of the 80s, we had our first attempt at uh, distributed computing. That was CORBA. And CORBA was interesting because it abstracted the network away. And that was handy. We had an object, and that object would ex execute, but not execute locally in our machine. It would execute in another machine. That was really cool, except that when we um, we're running our code, we didn't really know where it was going to execute, and there was network lag. 
and we never knew where, it, where, where and when it would uh, happen. So that was a problem. And then we solved that by turning our heads into service-oriented architecture, explicitly knowing when we are reaching for something outside of the local machine. But then, back then, we had uh, software that was uh, deploying different servers. They were communicating, or they needed to communicate, but they, at the time, they weren't built to communicate. So what we needed to do was put something in between that would translate the messages or the payload, right? And that sounds like a very nice idea, and it was. So we had servers that actually could communicate through that one middle thing, and that was how the enterprise service bus uh, came to be. But with time, well, we didn't even own the actual uh, uh, software uh, that needed to communicate. We only own, owned the part in the middle. So we started to put more and more logic there, more business logic in there. And then, well, it became so complicated that um, no one dared touching it. Because if you touch it and you break it, we break everything. And that was a problem with the enterprise service bus. So after that came finally microservices. And microservices has actually a principle which says um, smart endpoints dump pipes, exactly because of the problem of the enterprise service bus. So no smart things in the middle. All the smarts are in the end, in the microservices. And nowadays we're already talking about nano services, lambda serverless, and so on. In the end, if we think about it, it all evolved in the, in the, in the direction of modularity and encapsulation. Building things in small parts that can fit together and that can work together and that we can swap them and construct different things if we want to. And encapsulation, which is putting related code uh, together and hiding away the implementation details. <coughs> so let's talk about the monolith. Some time ago, a few years ago, when the microservices came into the hype, everyone was saying microservices are the way to go. Monolith is a big ball of mud all the time. Let's not do it anymore. But it's not true. Nowadays we know that microservices do don't solve all the problems. Microservices solve a set of problems and bring along another set of problems. <coughs> so the monolith in the end, uh, it can be a beautiful thing, and the microservices don't really solve all the problems that we had, and if we cannot solve it with the monolith, who says that we can solve it with microservices? So when do we have a big ball of mud then? For example, when class and method names, uh, they don't convey meaning. We actually have to dig into the code, go see what the method uh, does inside in order to understand uh, how the code works. And there's no obvious place to put the code. I remember once I was in a, I started at a company and, and I did my first task and then I asked a colleague, I asked him, hey, where, where should I put this? I mean, it's working now. I know it's working. I have the test for it, but where should he actually live? And he thought, yeah, I just put it anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So it, it shouldn't be like that. There should be a meaning to where you put your code. So also when you have a dependency mess, code depending on code, depending on code, depending on code, never ends, and you can't really isolate it. And then also when there's no boundaries, which means you cannot really have a sane testing strategy, which means it's quite difficult to refactor. And what do I mean with this? Well, refactoring means that you change code, but you don't actually change the behavior. And it also means that you have a test to prove that the code still works the same way. That's refactoring. When we test one class, we have private methods, and we don't test those private methods, right? Why? Because it's an implementation detail. Because we can at any moment change that code, and the class should behave the same. So we don't test it. We only test the public interface of that class. With modules, it's the same thing. 
we shouldn't test every little piece of code explicitly. We should test behavior, but that doesn't mean we have to explicitly write a piece of code, uh, a test, to every piece of code. Um, so when you have a module, you have one class that is an entry point, and you have nine other classes. <coughs> what should we test? Should we test all ten classes, or should we test only the public interface of the, of the module? Only the pub public interface of the module, because everything else is an implementation detail. You might want to change the behavior, the, 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 the code, the implementation of that module, but keep the behavior the same. And if you have tests for every single piece of code in that module, then you're going to have to rewrite every single test, and you're going to just waste time. Think also, for example, you know TDD, right? You know the three steps of TDD. So you go through all of that. In the end, you have a test and you have a class. And uh, that class, in the end, it's not the perfect, right? It's the first version of, uh, of the functionality. So, so you have a big class. And then you decide, OK, I'm going to refactor this, make it uh, easier to understand. So you refactor it. You have the test, so you keep checking that everything works you end up with uh, five classes. One class is the entry point. So you have five classes, you have one test. Should we change the test? No. The behavior is the same, you have the same test. So you have five classes, one test. You only test the, the public API of the, of the module. So in the end, this means that we don't have clear and enforced design rules. That's what it means to have a a big ball of mud. So what is a big ball of mud? Well, this is a big ball of mud. Uh, imagine you have this and you work with this and you need to take this to work every day. And then at work, you need to find uh, some nuts and bolts and you need to find some specific nuts and bolts. And what are you going to do with this? You're going to spend a bit of time uh, searching for the nut or bolt that you need, right? This is a mess. The same thing with the code. So what do we do when we have this? If you have this at home, and you want to go to work and just take a piece of, the, of your big ball of mud, just that specific type of bol bolts, what do you do? If you want to reach that point, then you just start to organize it, right? You put some bolts in one box, some bolts in another box, and so on. So you group them. Things that are similar, you put them together. This is encapsulation. So you put similar things in one little box, and you group the little boxes in a bigger box, and you put it in another box, and then you go to work, and you can choose what you want to take to work. And it's easy to find what you want. It's easy to use it, so on. You don't waste time with it. If you want to throw it away, it's also fine. You just know exactly what you want to throw away. These are granularity levels, and we can do the same thing with code. In code, you also have granularity levels. You have plain code. We have methods. We have classes, interfaces that are basically files. And then we have namespaces, which are folders. In the end, we have libraries as well. And I'm going to focus on the namespaces, because I think that's where we still um, fail quite a lot. So, a bit more of history. In uh, the end of the 90s, uh, Uncle Bob, Robert C. Martin, he started publishing a series of uh, principles. He didn't came up with the principles himself. He learned them from books, <coughs> from experience, from colleagues, and then he published it in an uh, online magazine. <coughs> Three of those principles are, uh, for me, quite important for this, for this talk. So first, the single responsibility principle. Um, which he defines as a class should have only one reason to change. But I think of it as a bit, a bit different. I think of it as a code unit should have one single responsibility. Because, well, a class, OK, should have one single responsibility, but the method, a method as well, and the module as well. If you think about an ORM, an ORM has one single responsibility. Translate from objects into a, uh, a database. One single, one single responsibility. <coughs> then we have the common closure principle. 
and the common reuse principle. That basically means that classes that work together, that change together, should be next to each other. So if we think about Symfony, in Symfony the default uh, folder structure, you have the source folder, and then inside there you have a folder for your controllers. And you put your controllers there, and then at some point you have 500 controllers, and you create some folders for those controllers, so you organize them a little bit. But then next to it, you have a folder for resources, and you have a folder inside that folder for the views, which are templates. And then the controllers work with the templates. And when you change the controllers, you're probably going to change the templates, and vice versa. And they work together. So why are we grouping, putting them far away from each other? What happens in the, in the end is that you have 500 controllers organized in a folder structure. You have maybe 700 views organized in a similar uh, folder structure that you try to keep up in sync, but you never do because there's 20, 30 developers uh, working in your company and it's always a mess. So you're going to make mistakes and then it's never in sync. It's always a mess to find what you need. It's always a big uh, uh, um, list of files to search for and so on. So what we should do, he says, that we should put it together. Have a controller, you have two, two templates using the being used by that controller, just put them next to, the, to it. It doesn't really matter if there are different file types or not. You're just a piece of code that works together. <coughs> In the 90s, we had layer architecture. In this case, three-tier architecture. Uh, dependencies are vertical. So you have the user interface depending on presentation, depending on business logic, depending on the database. Then 2003, and Eric Evans publishes his book about domain-driven design. And of course, domain-driven design is uh, a whole subject. So I cannot explain everything here, but I can explain what is more important in DDD and what's more important for this talk. So how does this start? How does domain-driven design start? It starts with domain expert interaction, people talking. Have the relevant and important people talking to each other, developers with uh, domain experts, POs, users, and so on. Nowadays, it's very common to do it with event storming. So together we create a ubiquitous language, which is a set of terminology that we can all uh, use in order to not have ambiguity when we are talking to each other about the product. So we have that common knowledge, and we can build a context map. And in that context map, we can draw on a whiteboard um, more or less what our application looked like. So we have, uh, for example, gene generic subdomains, in that case a, a CRM, which is generic, you can just get it off the shelf, so you don't need to build it. You can uh, have a support subdomain uh, that you might need to build it, uh, but it's not really your core business. It's not what you sell. And then you have your core domain. And your core domain is, um, is composed by several um, bounded contexts. The bounded context is an isolated piece of code that deals with something. For example, in this case, categories, products, orders, so on. There's a specific type of code, though, Although these uh, bounded codes are isolated, there's a specific type of code that sometimes we need to share. And that's called the shared kernel. And finally, there's the anti-corruption layer, which is something, uh, basically a translation layer, where you get some uh, data from uh, one bounded context, you translate it into what your bounded contact needs, uh, and you avoid leaking um, data structures from one bounded context into another bounded context. Then it's to five, 2005, and there's uh, Alistair, Alistair Corburn. He publishes a, a, a post in his blog about hexagonal architecture. He later renamed it to ports and adapters to convey more meaning to what he wanted to, um, to explain. Uh, so what he says is, OK, we have an application core. The application core does whatever it does. It doesn't matter. What uh, he wants to talk about is how the application communicates with, out with what is outside of the application. So the application has use cases. In this case, for example, create a user. Uh, and that's a port. That's an entry point for the application. On the other side, it has an SMS port. 
which is some kind of a door that allows the application to do something, in this case, send out SMSs. On the left side, we have the delivery mechanism, which can be HTTP, through an API, through a website, or it can, can also be a console command. Um, and on the right side, we have an external library, a tool. So what he says is, okay, to make this work, we create an adapter. On the left side, we have the primary or driver adapters. Driver because they drive the application, they tell the application what to do. And what they adapt is, they adapt the delivery mechanism into our use case. So if you have HTTP, you're probably going to have a controller, which will re receive a, um, a request, an HTTP request, get data out of it, and send it to the, to the use case. If we need to trigger the same use case through the command line, it's exactly the same thing. We create an adapter for the command line, we extract the data that we need from that uh, command, from the command line, and we send exactly, we trigger exactly the same use case. So we, there is no duplication of code. On the other side, we have the driven adapters. And the driven adapters are slightly different because the ports are different. On this side, a port, you can imagine it in the most simple uh, form as an interface. So there's an interface, and what we do is that we create uh, a class that implements that interface and wraps around the tool, wraps around the third-party library. With SMSs, for example, it's, it's quite easy to imagine that uh, some we are using some SMS provider and then some competition, some competitor of them, um, lowers the prices. So you want to change to save some money. Yeah, the only thing we need to do is create a new adapter for that uh, other provider, um, implement the interface, wrap around their library, and we're good to go. Uh, actually, in my company, the CTO, which only does some coding every two times in a year, imagined to uh, manage to replace our uh, SMS provider in one morning, if I'm not mistaken. So it's quite easy to do then. Of course, not all ports are, are as simple as an interface, um, especially when it comes to persistence, but you get the idea. So, so a small example of what is uh, what it looks like uh, an adapter, um, a, dri a driver adapter. So you have here a login controller. You get the constructor. It receives a service. In this, ca in this case, an authentic authentication service. We get it uh, from dependency injection. Then we have an action to log in, we get the, the um, HTTP request um, injected in that uh, action, we get data out of the HTTP request, and we pass it on to the use case. It's pretty simple in this case. On the other side, we have something very similar. So we have a, an adapter, it implements an interface, which is the port, it gets injected with dependency injection the client, which is the third-party library. Then we have a method that we can use. So we only pass some data into that method, and that data is transformed into whatever the client needs, the third-party library. So in this case, we're creating an object message, and we pass it in on to the, to the client, to the third-party library. Okay, so then it's uh, 2008, um, and Jeffrey Palermo, he um, came up with this idea of uh, onion architecture, and he, in, in opposing to the hexagonal architecture, we talked uh, which talked about what's outside of the application, he talks about what's inside of the application. And he al it identifies three layers. So the first one, the domain model, which is the representation of the domain, with entities, value objects that the entities use, and so on. Uh, so then there is the main business logic. And outside that, wrapping around that, we have domain services. Domain services are uh, is code that is still domain code, but the code that the logic doesn't quite fit in an entity. So it's ma ma mainly code that uh, coordinates entities. And outside that, Finally, we have the application services, so the application layer. 
In the application layer, for example, uh, repositories. Repositories, they get data from, uh, from uh, persistence, so they instantiate some entities, tell the entity to do something, persist the entity. It's a use case. Important here to note that the dependencies go inwards, so the outside layers know about the inside layers, the inside layers are completely is isolated from the outside layers. Then it's 2011, and Uncle Bob comes again and he says, we need to uh, uh, think about architecture and organize our code in a different way. The program, the software, so the, 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 the project should scream out what it does, what it is about. So we usually organize our controllers in one folder, our helpers in another folder, and so on. And we should do it differently. We should group them by, uh, um, by uh, 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 context. So you make these components. Component about healthcare, and you put everything about healthcare there. Billing, you have a component about billing, you put all, all things related to billing there, and so forth, so on. This is again encapsulation, modularity. Okay, this is uh, almost over this part. Eh? So then it, uh, it's uh, 2006, Greg Young comes along, starts talking a lot about CQRS. So how does this work? Well, we have the presentation layer, controllers. They uh, use a command object, which is just a DTO, just an object that has some data inside. Uh, they trigger, dispatch that command, that object with just data, no logic, just data. It sends it to the command bus, in the command bus, it works, well, like a bus. So there's several stops along the way. So that piece of data, it goes first to the first stop, it validates it later. It's, uh, if the data is uh, validated correctly, so it, if it's valid, then it moves on to the next step. Next step, it's, for example, opening a database transaction. And then the, that data, that command that means something, it will be handled. It will be handled by a command handler, which is basically an application service, is a use case. That use case, of course, gets that data, it knows what to do with that data, gets some data out of the database, tells it to do something or create some entity, persists it, so on. Fine, everything works out, goes back to the command bus, closes the transaction, and the data is saved in the database. Now, this is not very different from what we are used to doing without CQRS. The main difference here is that we have one command that means something to the domain. For example, create user, or upgrade user, or build whatever. But what's interesting here is that instead of handling the command, we can queue it. So instead, instead of immediately handling the command and leave the user waiting for it, we can send it to a, to a queue, and then we're done there. We can immediately return to the user. Then we have uh, workers that are pulling data from that queue, and they are finally executing it uh, and sending it to the command handler. This allows us to parallelize uh, processing and to uh, handle a lot more load, of course. Then there's also the query. So we are trying to separate the um, write model from the read model, and then there's always the, the also the query bus. To be honest, I never used this. Um, I never really needed it. I just create some query object and just do a query to the database, get the data that I need, and show it to the user. Okay, so finally, um, let's uh, give a recap on this. So you have the application core. On one side, you have the user interface. On the other side, you have the infrastructure. So you have our users that are using uh, our application. They do something in the on the website or with an API or whatever or a console command. Um, on the other side, we have the tools that we use, third-party libraries. And the first thing that uh, our request from the users uh, reaches is our controllers or the console command. Now these are going to get the data that the user sends and pass it on to the application. On the other side, we have the secondary or driven adapters. And they adjust a uh, third-party tool to what the application actually needs. So, again, remember, the dependencies go inwards, and then inside we have the ports, 
as the first thing, then the application layer, which is basically our use cases. We have the command and query buzz on the left side because it's what drives the application. When we issue a command, we're tell telling the application what to do. And on the other side, we have an event buzz. And events are important. They are similar to commands, but while the command tells the application to do something, an event tells, says that the application did something. So it, uh, it's triggered after something happens, after a use case happens, which is useful because you can make your application more organic, do something when something else happened. Then in the middle, we have finally the domain layer with the domain services and the domain model. <coughs> and finally, we slice our application. Remember the, screening, uh, the, the screaming architecture from Uncle Bob. We make these components. And here, it's very important then to have events. Because these components, these sections of our code base, they should be isolated. They should be bounded contexts. But then they need to work together, right? So how can they work together if they don't know about each other? Through events. So a command tells a component to do something, for example, create a user, and there's that component that's going to create the user, and then it triggers an event. Hey, a user has been created. And then whoever is listening to it will react to it and do whatever needs to be done. So there's one thing that is shared among the two components still, which is the event. But then comes into play the shared kernel that we saw from DDD. We clearly identify the code that is shared among components. <coughs> but there's more. So we had the application UI core and adapters, so mainly our application. Um, and then we have three more layers below it from which it depends. So the first one, the shared kernel that we talked about. In the bottom, of course, we have the programming languages, PHP or Java or whatever. <coughs> and then in between the shared kernel and the programming languages, we have still one layer, which I like to call the user land language extensions, which are our own, which is, is our own extension to the language. So think about it, for example, with um, uh, daytime uh, objects in PHP. They're native to PHP. We can use it everywhere, right? But they, they, they're pretty much agnostic. They're domain agnostic. They're ascetic. Um, so we can use it through our, our, our code, and that's fine. Unless, of course, we want to control, for example, for testing purposes, we want to control exactly what value is coming out of there, what value the data has, the date has, because if you're going to compare, compare objects on your tests, and there is one second difference, or one micro microsecond difference, then it's going to fail, and it shouldn't, right? So you want to control that. But then, yeah, you have daytime objects being instantiated all over the place. They're native, you're using it correctly, but it's not quite working out for you. So what do you do? You make a wrapper around it. Create your own daytime object, which can be just a wrapper around the native daytime object, and then you use that one. And at runtime, you can just swap the implementation in the, during the tests. Same thing with the UUIDs. UUIDs are pretty much agnost agnostic. They're ascetic. In that case, they are not uh, uh, part of uh, PHP. The reason being that um, UUIDs kind of uh, have a new version every once in a while. And it's not really a good idea to put it into the core of PHP because then the PHP actual core developers will have to update it all over all the time. So it's easier to have it as an external library. But still, it's quite agnostic. And we could use it in our code base as just, yeah, it's a UUID, but so what? But we don't want to be depending on a third party library so we can make our own wrapper around it. <coughs> then we can control it. Then you can use it as if it was part of the language. <coughs> so we have this um, dependencies as well. Okay, so we have these ideas, we have the, the, these principles, we have uh, some idea of how to put it all together. 
um, but it's still very abstract, right? Just ideas, just some sketch on a paper. Well, um, there's this idea as well about architecturally evident coding style. It means basically two things. One, that uh, we can drop hints uh, in our code about the, the architectural responsibilities of each piece of code. Uh, this means, for example, uh, or mainly even, um, class names. So if you have a repository that deals with users, then we call it user repository. That's pretty simple. You know what the repository is? Okay, that class is a repository. I know how it should be used, where it should be used, and if it's going to be used, uh, if I see it being used in the, in the wrong way, then I know this is a mistake, I need to fix it. Now, I don't say that we should do that everywhere. If we have uh, entities, I don't say that we should push fix uh, an entity name, user entity, that doesn't really sound very good. I think it's uh, redundant. But as everything, we should um, think about what makes sense to use. And then there's also Simon Brown saying that we should uh, reflect the architecture in the code, um, which is basically the same idea as, uh, as uh, scheming architecture and slicing the code into pieces. So, we had one more idea, but how do we actually put this to practice? Well, what's the boundary in the end? If you have a monolith, if you have microservices, the boundary is the microservice itself, right? You have HTTP in between. In a monolith, a boundary is just a folder. That's what it is. It communicates something to you. So if you have user interface, the application core, and infrastructure, you can just create folders for it. Um, then, yeah, what's inside the folder for the user interface? Well, you have um, APIs, right? You can have a Graf GraphQL API and the REST API. So you can have a folder for all, all your APIs and a folder for each type of API. You have console commands, so you create a, co a folder for all your console commands. And you can have several websites running on your application. You have a website for admin and a website for the actual consumers. Think, for example, of WordPress has uh, a view that is only for the users going to the, uh, to the, to the, to the website. But it is, there's a completely different website for administering the, the blog, right? So it's two different websites, two di different views of the same application. Then on the infrastructure side, pretty much the same thing. We have a folder for the infrastructure, then one folder for each, for each uh, tool that we use. And inside each one of those uh, tool folders, we have a folder for each vendor adapter. So think, for example, you have an application and your application sends out SMSs. It's here in Poland. We are going to we are going to uh, expand to the Netherlands. And you figure out, or business figures out, yeah, we have a provider here in Poland, but in the Netherlands it's cheaper to send SMSs with another provider. So what do you do? You create two adapters, and then it's just a matter of configuring configuration. If it's in the Netherlands, you use one adapter. If it's Poland, you use another adapter. Then you have two adapters living next to each other and you are using them in your application real in, in, in production. <coughs> then the core. This is a bit more complicated. So, first level, you have the components, so one folder for all your components. You have, for example, the blog component. Inside the blog component, we're going to have one application, one, one layer, for the, which is the application layer, with all the code that related to that, uh, to that layer. And then another folder next to it for the domain layer with whatever code is needed there. Then you have a folder for your ports that identify each one of your uh, tools. Now the ports folder is not inside the components folder because it's not a component. It's something, it's code that is going to be used by all your components. So it's uh, outside of the components next to the component folder but it's still inside of the core because it's the ports are what tells you how you're going to use a specific tool. Then finally, next to the components and the ports, you have the shared kernel. 
which is also not uh, part of a specific component, is shared among all components. So it's uh, still in the core, but then next to the components folder. So again, recap. So we have our source folder. We have three main folders, one for the user interface, the core, and then the infrastructure. Inside the core, we have components, uh, and we have ports. Each component has its own application and domain layer. Then we still have the shared kernel, which is part of the core. Then finally, we have uh, the langu language extension, which is something that uh, you own. You control it entirely, and that's very important because you don't want some uh, uh, open source project to change their code and then suddenly your application breaks. So you own this, and this can, is something that can be owned only for that project, but maybe it can be even be reused in other projects of your company. The important thing is that you own it, and you can change it, and you can improve it as, uh, as you see fit. In this case, we put it in a lib folder next to the source folder because it's completely unrelated to, to, the, to the core uh, uh, code of your application. And you can even extract it and put it in your own uh, in a separate project and just include it with comp Composer. So we have all these ideas. We know how to um, uh, put these ideas to practice, but we're going to make mistakes. And how do we prevent uh, mistakes from happening? How do we make sure that we're not going to have problems down the line because of mistakes? Well, the same way we do with the rest of the code. We test it. So we have unit tests, integration tests, and so on. For structure, you can do the same thing. There's this uh, tool, command line tool, called DepTrack. It was built by, by the guys at Symfony, um, Essential Labs. And well, the way it works, you just create a, a, conf a configuration file in YAML. You specify the layers that you have, and you specify a rule set saying, okay, layer A can depend on layer B, layer B can be depend on layer C, and so on. And then you run it. You run it like you run any other test, like you run unit tests. It's a command line tool. If, it, uh, if there's a rule being broken, it spits out an error, it fails, you put it in the CI, Run it like uh, unit tests, fails the build, we need to fix it. That's it. If um, the command line uh, output is not enough for you, you need to understand it a bit better. It can also generate some uh, nice uh, uh, images for you. So you see, for example, controllers are allowed to depend on services and queries and repositories. But if a repository is going to depend on the controller, then you can see that something is wrong, right? If you have a, a bigger application, then you can have, in the end, something like this. So you see, for example, here, the domain depends on nothing except for the code itself, so the, the extension, which is part of the language, as you see it. It depends also on the shared kernel domain, which is the part of the domain uh, that is uh, shared within uh, several components. Um, we can see, for example, code depending on PSR um, interfaces. You can see the infrastructure uh, depending on a lot of stuff, but nothing is depending on the infrastructure. So the infrastructure being third-party libraries. Why? Because there's ports and adapters uh, isolating that, um, that infrastructure code. So our code actually depends on the ports, and then there's adapters making the connection. So finally, the last slide, um, if you fell asleep in the meantime, uh, this is the moment you need to wake up. So first takeaway, a code unit must have only one logic place to live. Now by this, I don't mean that we magically know where the code is or where it should be. What I mean is, when we open the source folder, if we're looking for a controller that uh, creates users, Okay, we open the source folder, it's user interface stuff. Okay, go into the folder of user interface. Okay, 
Um, now you, uh, it's about users. So we have several folders there, use cases, whatever, modules. Oh, it's about, there's a folder here for users, go into that one, and so forth, so on. So we can navigate. It's not that we magically know where it lives, but we can navigate through it in a logical way. Make the architecture explicit. And by this, I don't mean that you should do exactly what I say here. It's not about following this, 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 uh, this like a dogma. No, it's, it's that you, okay, you will learn these uh, patterns, you learn these ideas, and you use what you need. But the important thing, the, 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 the most important message that, we, that I want to pass here is make sure everyone understands and everyone is on the same page. Make sure people look at the code and they can understand what's going on there. Either by name of code or, or, or by folders. Um, but people can understand that. Communicate with your colleagues and make decisions together with your colleagues about how you should structure the application. What makes sense for your team? It should be, it must be, explicit for everyone. In the end, no matter whatever, uh, what is the, the, the way you uh, organize your code base, uh, you must favor modularity and encapsulation. This is not um, a software development principle. This is an engineering principle. You find it everywhere. You find it in software, but you find it in mechanics, you find it in electronics, you find it in buildings, you find it in uh, building cars, puzzles, whatever. It's always about modularity and encapsulation. This is engineering. Build monoliths, but plan microservices. Uh, this is not to be taken literally. Um, what I mean is, for me, it helps me to think about microservices. How would I do this if I would uh, do it in microservices? Where would be the boundaries? How would I make these this, this isolated pieces of code communicate? And then adapt that to a monolith. If you have a monolith, of course. If you have microservice, well. But it helps to think about it in, 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 in that way. If I had uh, an explicit HTTP layer there, how would I do this? And in the end, of course, architecture, because you're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect. Uh, you have junior developers, you have senior developers. Some people know some things better, some people know other things better. And even if we know things very well, we are just humans. We're going to make mistakes. So we need to enforce it. That's it. <coughs> There's um, here some links for the slides, or similar slides to this one. Uh, code sample in PHP. Um, my blog posts uh, explaining all this and more. And please give me some uh, rating on uh, Giant Dean so that I can improve myself. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, it doesn't work as usual. <laughs> you can just, uh, yeah, speak loud. I don't know. Um, yeah, so the question is, if I tried reversing the core with the components and having uh, the core inside, have one core for each component, if I understand correctly, that's the question. Um, yeah, I gave this a lot of thought. I don't think that's the best approach, personally. Uh, maybe it works. It depends also on the context and on the team. But for me, I don't think that's the best approach because here we're talking about the core of the application. And, and the, the way the application is structured is there's, okay, the, I mean, the core is actually the application. The way you 
reach the application is the um, driver adapters, right? But then the application itself is the core. And then what you want to do is slice that application uh, in pieces that uh, deal with one specific set of logic. So I don't quite see it as um, a, a component having a core. Or I see it uh, as a component having as a component having an application layer and a, and a domain layer. And maybe the domain layer, you can imagine it as a core, but um, yeah, I, you need to give it nam different names. And yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't see it that way. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, I'm not a lot of knowledge, so maybe your approach works as well, or maybe it works better. Uh, for me, what my experience, this works uh, really well. Um, we're having uh, one folder for each component, so we're clearly separating them anyway. Of course, uh, at some point, if you want to transform this component into a microservice, then yes, then you, if you structure it the same way, you're going to also have a core folder for it inside that microservice. And then that core will be maybe separated even in, in, in other slices. It depends also on the, the size of that, uh, that microservice you're going to have. But yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. I hope I answered uh, sat satisfactory. Any other questions? Excuse me. Thanks. I have a question about the validation. Uh, you said that the validation should be on the command bus, but what if I want to use the validation uh, validation component from the Symfony and the command bus is inside my core? So it shouldn't be dependent on the infrastructure detail, right? No, the, um, the command bus is part of the infrastructure, so it's not in the core. Um, the command class itself will live in the application layer, um, but you can use the, the, the Symfony uh, uh, validator in the command bus anyway. Yeah, if I um, dispatch the command on my command bus, so the command handler is responsible to handle that command. So where is the place for the validation using the third party library? Let me, let me just get there. Okay, so we have so we have as part of the infrastructure, you have a message bus, right? And the message bus is not a command bus, and it's not an event bus, it's a message bus. Now what we do is that we use this with two different adapters. One adapter is going to be implementing the command bus, and another adapter implementing the event bus. But in the end, they're both uh, message buses, and they're both part of infrastructure. So in your controller, you're going to get injected the command bus dispatcher, which is basically the command bus, um, you instantiate the command object and you send it to the command bus. The command bus lives here. Okay, so it, what figures out, it figures out which handler is going to handle that command and it's going to deliver it. The command handler lives here. So it's completely, in, in reality, conceptually, it, it's working on this side because it's, it's driving the application, but it's actually the, the, the bus itself is actually part of, uh, of infrastructure. So what you says is wrap up the third party library like the command bus and inject there the validation and do the validation on that. Bus. Yes, but not quite inject there the validation because the command bus needs to be, well, it's basically set up with configuration. So in the end we have 
uh, a service in the YAML file that configures it. You have a service that is the command dispatcher, and then you have a list of, 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 of uh, um, what do you call it, bus steps or whatever you call it. And one of these steps is actually the validator. And the command bus, what it, what it does is, well, basically, um, you can imagine it, it's not exactly, but you can imagine it as a for each loop. Okay, you have this command, now for each one of the uh, steps, uh, give this command into that step. So the first step is going to be the validator, and then it validates or not, and the buzz itself is part of infrastructure, and it's going to get injected the, the Symfony validator, which is also part of infrastructure, so your application core doesn't know anything about the validator of Symfony. Th did this make sense? It makes. <laughs> Uh, any other question? Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you uh, write your code uh, on top of any framework like Symfony, and if yes, uh, how do you treat the framework code as a uh, what kind of layer? Yeah, we we use Symfony. Uh, I use Symfony. Um, yeah, I treat it as part of infrastructure because your, your application itself doesn't care what framework it's using. So in an um, in ideal world, you would be able to swap the, the, the framework. You should be able to swap the framework and your application would still be able to work. Of course, in practice, that's not going to happen, or at least uh, uh, not easily. Um, on a pet project of mine, I did uh, go through with all that uh, separation, and, and I didn't. Man I wanted to manage to, to replace Symfony with uh, with uh, with another framework just to try it out to see how it uh, if it was was at all possible. But I didn't. Uh, I don't have the time for it. But but yeah, we treat it as infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I add to your answer for him? Sure. So. What you can do, and what we did in our company that helps a lot to switch frameworks, rely on the PSRs. So for example, uh, do not rely in the Symfony request and response classes. Rely in the PSR interfaces, because then each framework is going to implement that interface, so you can just switch. Cool? More questions? I think we have uh, zero minutes. Yeah, zero <laughs> minutes. Yeah. So we're done, I guess. If you uh, want to make more questions and I'm outside, just uh, reach out. And that's it. Cool. Thank you.